<clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, as I, I'm assuming you can hear me okay. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, some of the technical indicators that we use to predict the market or to at least forecast the market, let's say. Um, <clears throat> and many of these have to do with options, although not all of them do. Uh, we have some um, new uh, buy signals that I'll be talking about today as well. So that's a pretty, it's a timely, uh, timely situation right here. Um, <clears throat> let me just, let's see. I, I see that it says it's showing my screen. Are you seeing my screen at all? Uh, yes, I see uh, the screen that says the current state of market predicted prediction. Options and okay, I, can't, I can't seem to operate my own screen though for some reason. Uh, I don't know what's going on here exactly. Um, well, <clears throat> okay, this this should, hopefully this will do it. Um, so, okay. So, can, uh, can you see the writing on the screen there? Is that is that showing up? All right, uh, just a little bit about our company. Uh, we, uh, the company is about 25 years old. We, uh, we started out as a research company publishing uh, research and recommendations and newsletters. Since then, we've moved quite uh, heavily into money management. So we're managing uh, a, a large number of option, individual option accounts right now. And we also do a certain amount of option education uh, with our mentoring program, as well as uh, seminars, webinars like this, and <clears throat> books, and etc. cetera. Uh, this URL here, optionstrategist.com forward slash NovWeb, will uh, take you to a page that has a discount. We will be emailing you the PDF of this presentation, so you don't need to you know, frantically write everything down. Uh, the coupon code to get the specials is NOVWeb. So let's, uh, let's talk about the market. Uh, we look at four major things here. Uh, one is the uh, chart of the S&P 500. Uh, that's the most important thing, actually, because no matter what your indicators say, if the market's doing something else, then you need to really <laughs> pay attention to what the market's doing. Um, yeah, I'm not one of these people who likes to get short in a, in, a, in a roaring bull market and get run over or get long in a big bear market. So we uh, we use trend following indicators, and uh, we have a number of our indicators are good swing indicators catching reversals as well. But um, you know, unless the chart of the S&P 500 is agreeing, I'm not being all in on anything. Another thing we look at is uh, put call ratios. Uh, we'll talk about a, a, a few different kinds of those, but uh, they're very important in measuring uh, sentiment, especially contrary sentiment. Market breadth is a, another important indicator, and then the volatility indices, VIX, and uh, related things like that are also uh, something that we rely on quite heavily. So uh, before we actually look at the charts or discuss any of these indicators, uh, you'll notice that in certain cases we're going to see overbought, uh, you know, in this market right now, some overbought indicators. But overbought does not mean sell. The market can go up for long periods of time, like it did, for example, 2013 to 2015, while the market is overbought. So that, you know, the kind of indicators like MACD or some of those where people use them just to identify overbought conditions and then short the market, to me that, that doesn't work. Uh, so, oversold, similar. If the market's oversold, that doesn't mean buy. In fact, some of the, the largest, most obnoxious market declines that we've had have come when the market is oversold. So, it's really, uh, you need to wait for confirmed signals before you take any action. So here's the two-year chart of the S&P 500, and you can see a couple of things here. <clears throat> Let me set my ink color here. Uh, first of all, we had 
you know, this, this row of highs in 2015, uh, this whole area really in here was a topping area. The market fell back from there a few times and finally broke through, uh, ironically, right after Brexit this year. Uh, and then we rallied to a new high, sold off some a little bit, worried about the election, and of course, <laughs> ironically, now again, we're at new highs right after the election. So, um, you know, the S&P chart is positive. I mean, we're in... Uh, new all-time uh, highs, and there's really no way that you can interpret that as negative if you're a trend follower. You can see the major trend in the market is this blue line right here, um, but there are other smaller trends. You know, obviously we've we've come up quite steeply, and we could pull back. We should be able to find support here at and this line. is at 21.95, and there's also some support at 21.75, 21.80. So. Uh, when you break out to new highs, it's fairly common to come back and maybe try a little bit of a retest. But uh, this market has a lot of momentum right now, so uh, you know we we as you'll see, we got buy signals down in this area, and we're still riding those buy signals. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we use as a as a buy and sell signals on the S and P 500 chart is something that I call modified Bollinger bands. You're probably familiar with Bollinger bands. They were invented by John Bollinger, and what he did was he took the 20-day moving average of the something, let's say in this case the S&P 500, and uh, based on the volatility of that uh, that something that you're charting, uh, this index, he drew um, plus and minus two and three standard deviation bands around the moving average, and those are the Bollinger bands. So in terms of times of low volatility, they'll they'll shrink down low, like here. And at times of high volatility, they'll spread out real wide like they did last uh, January or last, last August. So um, in the, the world of option trading, uh, the, the king uh, mathematical guy is black or people are black and Scholes who invented the black Scholes model. And it, the way that black Scholes determines volatility is a slightly different way than than John Bollinger did it. Uh, I thought John Bollinger's way was quite logical. It's a, it takes a standard deviation of closing prices, and that's his volatility. But uh, the, the, these heavy math guys, the MIT guys, decided that they're going to call volatility the standard deviation of daily percentage price changes. So it's slightly different. And since all of our work uh, has to adhere to the Black-Scholes model, otherwise our option valuations don't make any sense, we took the black -Scholes definition amount of volatility and use that in, in the Bollinger uh, equation and, and in that way we draw the modified Bollinger bands. So these are slightly different than regular Bollinger bands, but the idea is the same. And our buy and sell signals occur this way. So here, with, with the bands you're seeing right here, uh, the, top, the, top, the, the top band is plus four standard deviations, or sigma. This next band in here is plus three sigma. And on the downside, the lower band is minus four sigma, and the one inside that is minus three sigma. So those are the only bands we're concerned with here. And if the market moves down, let's take, take way over on the left-hand side of the chart here. If the market moves down and closes below the uh, minus four standard deviation band, and then later closes inside the three standard deviation band, that's your buy signal. So that's the buy signal that this B is referring to. And you can see that uh, that was a pretty good buy signal market took off, and then it gave a sell signal on the upside. First, it gave us a, a false signal. It actually came outside and back inside right there as a false sell signal. But then it gave an accurate one up here, coming outside and then back inside. And while it was short lived, it was pretty good. It re actually resulted in another buy signal. Um, every buy signal doesn't lead to a sell signal. You can see we kind of went along there in 2015, just kind of drifting along, and then the market sold off heavily in August. We got another buy signal down here. That did result in a uh, sell signal in early November, and then the early January thing that we had this year was culminated with another buy signal. We had another buy signal at Brexit, and then we had just had another buy signal on November uh, 9th at the election, at our election. So. Um, every buy signal, as I said, doesn't end in a sell signal, but ideally it will come up and at least tag the plus four standard deviation band and allow you to get out. So that just happened yesterday, I'm sorry, uh, Friday. 
We tag the band right there, and so that that cell signal, that buy signal is now over. But we haven't got a cell signal yet. So this is very uh, something we uh, pay attention to. You can see the signals are infrequent. Really, there you only have you know, the. And by the way, the blue letters indicate signals that were losers. The red letters indicate signals that were winners. And uh, so we had a total there of like 10 signals, eight of which were accurate. Uh, so in summary, just on the SPX chart, we broke out to new all-time highs. That confirms a breakout by all the other major indices, which actually broke out first. The, the Russell 2000, the uh, value line. The NASDAQ composite, the Dow, all of these are new all time highs. Um, the first support level is at 2195, which was the old high, so that is support by just by definition when you break through it. And uh, there's very important support down at 2120 if the market should ever turn and get down that far. You know, a violation of that level could be the beginning of a new bear market. Uh, the trend lines are positive on the chart as well. So overall, the SPX chart is positive and bullish, and, and that's good because so are most of the other indicators. So the next indicator we want to look at is the put-call ratio. And put-call ratios are, uh, I think, very useful. We look at the equity-only put-call ratio. That means all stock options that trade. So in this case, it's millions of options per day. Uh, but we don't include any futures options and we don't include any index options in that calculation. And it's a contrary indicator. So if too many people are buying puts, that means there's too much bearishness out there, then we'd want to do something bullish. Conversely, if too many people are buying calls, then everyone else is bullish and we'd want to do something bearish. So we want we need to quantify what too much is, of course, and we'll get to that in just a second. The uh, put call ratios originally were defined just using the volume of options that trade. Uh, Marty Zweig, uh, the late Marty Zweig, des uh, de designed these in the late 1950s when he was taking the data out of the weekly ads in Barron's, uh, the ads being those of the put call dealers at the time, and they would just trade a few hundred puts and calls per week. Maybe there were five or six dealers, so he'd add those all up and create a put call ratio. Uh, why he didn't make it a call put ratio, I'm not sure, but this is what he did, so that's how we use it today. So imagine we're looking at, say, at IBM. So at the end of the day, we sum up the volume on all the puts that traded on IBM, and separately we sum up the volume that traded on all the calls on IBM, and we divide the two. That's the put call ratio. So obviously, since puts are in the numerator of this fraction, heavy put buying, which occurs in a down market, is going to make this ratio go higher. Conversely, uh, since calls are in the denominator of the fraction, heavy call buying, which occurs in a bull market, will make the, this this rate uh, this ratio uh, go down. So uh, we keep a moving average. I use 21 days just in case there's something to Fibonacci, but uh, you do need to use a moving average because the daily uh, numbers are quite erratic. So uh, b before we look at the current chart, let's just talk about this, this symmetry. So ideally, we'd want to see complete inverse symmetry between the underlying price, the stock price, and the put call ratio. So for example, let's say we, we come to a, uh, on a sell signal, uh, the market, so we, we get down here, we get this, we get this sell signal. So the market, the stock is declining, and as it's declining, people start buying more and more puts. Which, so during the trend, the public is right. So they're buying more puts. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> the market, the ratio is declining. You buy more calls. So the market is now. Uh, hello, is this okay? Uh, so uh, let's just let me just reset this. So the. Uh, in this case, the stock is declining after the sell signal. People are buying more puts. Eventually, they run out of um, desire to buy puts, and the ratio peaks, and the, sort of the last guy who wanted to buy puts jumps in and buys puts. At that time, the ratio starts to decline because there really are no more put buyers, and that's a buy signal for the stock. So let's look at an example. This is not current, but you get the idea here. The S&P 500. Uh, index is on the top and on the bottom is the equity only put call ratio. So you can see the inverse symmetry that's taking place 
along the way. And so peaks in the put call ratio are buy signals for the underlying, and troughs in the uh, put call ratio are sell signals for the underlying. So you can see that it works pretty well. So here's the current chart. And this is, again, just using volume. And it's a little bit noisy. In other words, there's a lot of signals on that chart. And when we get to the weighted put call ratio, which are coming up next, they're going to uh, not, not be as quite so many signals. But in a, in a market that's trending very nicely, uh, you, you tend to get longer signals. So for example, last year, in uh, coming off that nasty August sell-off, we had buy signals in, in September and October. And the market trended higher for a while. And as it did, of course, the put call ratio is going lower as people are buying more and more calls. Eventually, the call buyers tire, and the put call ratio rolls over, giving us a sell signal. We come up here, and that, that sell signal occurred you know, about, about right in here. <clears throat> so it's a pretty good sell signal. <clears throat> and try to write a little better than that. So that's, that's our sell signal there. And then the market declined again for quite a while. And as that was happening, people were buying puts. And we come up and eventually get this buy signal. As the market's gotten choppier this year, we started oscillating back and forth between these buy and sell signals. And just uh, before Bre uh, the US election here, we had a buy signal, a little peak there. And immediately now, we've gone back to a sell signal. Um, but the market's still making all-time high. So you know, you kind of have to wonder what's going on. So just remember this right now. The standard ratio, which is based strictly on the volume of options that traded, has given a sell signal. We'll come back to that in a minute. Now, the weighted ratio is computed uh, a little bit different. With the advent of computers, of course, we can do more calculations, more complex calculations. Not that this is really complex, but it's just tedious if you had to do it by hand. So at the end of every day, we calculate the dollar volume of options that's traded. So we take the options closing price times the volume that it traded that day. Now, you could do this tick by tick if you wanted to, but I'm, I'm just not that. I don't think it pro provides that much extra information. So we sum up this dollar volume for all the puts, let's say, at IBM that day. Separately, we sum it up for all the calls at IBM. We divide the two, and that's the weighted per call ratio. So now we're measuring the dollars that are being spent on bearish opinion versus the dollars that are being spent on bullish opinion. In my, you know, in my way of thinking, this is a much better uh, measure because um, sometimes the, the, the money is really what you want to follow, not necessarily just uh, the volume. So here's the current weighted put call ratio chart. You can see there are fewer signals. And again, we had those same ones you know, last year, buy in October. Sell in November, buy in end of January, early February this year. Now back and forth. And now this one did give a buy uh, just about the time of the election. And it's still on the buy. It's still declining. So as long as the put call ratio is still declining, we're on a buy signal for the market. And we won't get a sell signal until this you know, curls back up somewhere along the road, down the road. So now, <clears throat> remember we had a sell signal from the standard ratio and a buy signal now from the weighted ratio. Usually they don't disagree for too long. But what's really going on here is if you think about it, people are kind of nervous. Uh, markets may do all-time highs on what a lot of people think is, you know, a lot of uh, positive, o overly positive forward uh, thinking. And so some people are getting nervous and they're starting to buy puts for protection. Well, when you buy puts for protection, you generally buy out of the money, low price puts. So you're not spending a lot of dollars, but you're creating a lot of volume. So on the standard ratio chart, which we saw had started to rise because put volume was heavy, that's reflecting that heavy volume of low dollar uh, cost puts. Here, we're looking at the overall thing, and there's still, when we take into account all the dollars that are being spent on puts and calls, it's still more dollars being spent on calls than puts, and so this ratio is declining. Overall, I, I think, you know, uh, contrary indicators, sentiment indicators like this have a problem when the action is dominated by non-speculators. So the standard chart is now be beginning to be dominated by hedgers. And when you have hedgers or arbitrageurs dominating the action, 
they can create a false signal. So I'm interpreting this still as somewhat positive since the weighted ratio that we're looking at right now is still on a, on a buy signal. But uh, just to review, so both, both gave buy signals last February, chopped along this year. They gave a buy signal right before November election. But now there's a divergence between the two, divergence between volume and standard, uh, which is the standard ratio, and dollar volume, which is the weighted ratio. Uh, we, you might ask, well, how soon do we know when these things are rolling over? We have a pretty accurate way of looking at it. We're using a kind of chess tree uh, computer program that takes a look at this, what's coming off the moving average and what's expected to come onto the moving average. So uh, we publish on our website in what we call the strategy zone. We publish about 450 of these put call charts every day. And uh, the computer analysis that goes along with each one of them is, is shown there as well. Um, so overall, I would rate I would rate the put call signals as mixed to positive. They're mixed because one's on a buy signal and one's on a sell signal. But I'm giving it the two positive, uh, you know, I don't know if we need to put that in quotes or something, but you know, two positive because. Uh, the weighted ratio is still bullish, and I think the uh, hedgers are dominating the other one. Now, um, <clears throat> I'm, I don't have a chart of this. I'm just going to mention it. The total put call ratio, which looks at all uh, equity and index options that trade, also gave a buy signal late last week, and it's still on that buy signal, uh, at least for now. But we can use this approach not just for broad market, but for some a lot of individual stocks or futures contracts. So here's Intel, for example. And usually on these, I look for just the extreme. So you can see on this chart, I, I wouldn't be too interested in that signal because it's kind of in the middle of the chart. But here, this sell signal or this sell signal, I would because they're at very low levels. In other words, 40, what this really means, again, this is the weighted ratio up here at the top, weighted ratio, means $40 of being spent on puts for every $100 being spent on calls. So that's a pretty low ratio of dollars on puts to dollars on calls. So those are, are very good sell signals. In other words, everybody's bullish. Everybody's uh, they're spending the $100 on calls. Hardly anybody's buying any puts, only $40 being spent on puts. So those are sell signals you can see that on this chart, at least, both those sell signals work pretty well. There was this one and then this one. And uh, conversely, we have the buy signal. We have three extreme buy signals here on this chart as well. This one, this one, and this one over here. If I can get my so uh, those are extreme level buy signals, and they all work pretty well too. But you know, again, I wouldn't be taking these ones in the middle. Now here we did use this buy signal to cover this short. In other words, it rolled back over so it's no longer on a sell signal. So we, we covered the short, actually we have we were long puts, we covered, uh, we sold the puts that we owned. So you can use the signals in the middle, but I use them as only getting out of a previous position, not getting into a new one. Uh, here's Netflix, this uh, gave us a couple of, well actually on this chart, three very good sell signals and even this extreme level uh, buy signal over here was not not bad either. So uh, these you know these are some of the bigger stocks. We watch these as I said there's several hundred uh, a day, and in our newsletters, especially in the, uh, the daily strategist or the option strategist newsletters, we uh, make recommendations based on these. Here's Boeing. We just had a sell signal on Boeing uh, recently. We put it in our we put this out to our customers last week, and. Um, let me see if I can just, where are we here? Right there. So um, this sell signal just occurred. It started down a little bit, now it's kind of back up a little bit. But you can see that the last time we had a sell signal like this was, was over here. And it kind of, you know, messed around for a little while before it eventually started uh, heading back, heading down. So it kind of went sideways a little bit before it went down. And the one extreme buy signal on the chart is right there. and That was a, a pretty good buy signal as well. So Boeing, uh, that's a relatively new signal. And if you're interested, I, we're still in that one. Um, here's uh, the VXX, which is the uh, volatility ETF uh, created by Barclays back in 2009. Right now, 
VXX is getting hammered because volatility is going lower. And the way that this works is it goes, this, this drops even faster than VIX does during a bull market because uh, the term structure of the futures is harmful to it. So it's making new lows, and as a result, people are buying puts, so the put call ratio is going higher. Remember, put, put buying forces the ratio higher. Now, we don't have a signal. Eventually, this will roll over, and that would give a buy signal. Right now, we're just in an oversold state, so because uh, there is this heavy put buying, but as I said, oversold does not mean buy. So oversold, the market's oversold, this market's oversold. When this buy signal occurs, though, remember that vol volatility goes up, which that's what that would mean. That would be negative for SPX. So this is would be sort of a sell signal for us for the S&P 500 if this occurred. Hopefully, many of our other things would be better uh, than this, but it's just interesting to look at it. Uh, in the post-election um, fury, the dollar has been very strong. Uh, bonds have been selling off, and of course, as you might imagine, that's created some extremes. So here's the Swiss franc, and uh, at the bottom here, I have a little note too that the euro, EC is the euro, the euro futures, uh, has a very similar chart. So right now, with the dollar being strong and uh, you know perhaps very uh, pro-business. Uh, and pro-dollar policy is about to be enacted, the Swiss franc is dropping. And now as the Swiss franc dropping, people are buying puts on it like mad. So they push this thing up to an oversold condition. Uh, 400 puts, for example, are being bought for every $100, uh, $400 worth of puts are being bought for every $100 worth of calls. That's a lot, although in futures it can get, get higher. Eventually, this will roll over and give a buy signal. But uh, you know we're not there yet. So again, oversold does not mean buy. And the euro chart looks very similar. Here's just a plain old stock GoPro. For this has been under a lot of pressure. Again, recently the stock has been selling off heavily, and that's as that's happened, people have been buying a lot of puts. Uh, it started to roll over right there, but according to the computer programs that we use, that is still not yet a buy signal. The computer is saying there's still a chance this is going to go higher, so we have not rated that as a buy signal yet. Here's T-bonds. Uh, again, just like the dollar, these things, these things were selling off anyways, and then once the election happened, they sold off very sharply, and people have really been buying puts here, and so forced all the way up here. Now, it does have this little curly cue at the top there, <clears throat> and the computer program is rating that as a buy signal. I put the question mark there, though, because we're so high that what, you know, what can really happen here in the the, the numbers coming, you know, onto the moving average has got to start drift, dropping down a little bit. But technically, this is a buy signal. Uh, those that's a continuous futures chart there. But um, so, you know, you don't have to buy futures options. Obviously, you have, you've got the TLT, which is the uh, long-term ETF bond ETF. You can buy call, uh, calls on the ETF if you wanted to take the signal, um, just as for, you know, fair warning, we have not taken this signal, uh, but it, it, you know, certainly at an extreme level, and I'm still under consideration, I may take it later. <clears throat> Here's U.S. Steel, and that, this, uh, the steel stocks have been very strong in the wake of the election, and this, this had a good over, uh, overall track record. Anyways, you can see this extreme buy signal here was a good one, then this extreme sell signal down here was pretty good, and then this extreme sell signal last August was very good, and now we're down here, we're very overbought, and the rate at which the put call ratio is declining has slowed down, but still it hasn't rolled over and done that, So, and the computer program is not saying that it's about to. So again, overbought, not yet a sell signal, just despite the little hook up on the top. You know, when, you, when you're using these sentiment indicators, or, or any kind of trend following indicator, uh, or count even, any, any indicator based on a trend, with trend following or counter trend, you are going to, uh, you're not going to hit the exact high and the low. But on the other hand, you're not going to think you hit the exact low and keep buying all the way to the bottom either. So, um, I, you know, we'll miss, we might miss a little. You can see these, this uh, sell signal there came in, you know, a little bit late and a little bit after the top. You know, same, same thing with the, the one over here. But that's the way these work. So. 
uh, still plenty of movement to come after that uh, when this and when and if this actual cell signal does appear. <clears throat> All right, so enough on Poco ratios. Uh, if you're interested, again, as I said, what we call the strategy zone on our website shows a lot of these charts, and then in our uh, two main newsletters, the daily strategies and the option strategies, we make a specific recommendation, recommendations based on those charts. So the third thing we look at is breadth. So breadth is very simply the number of advancing issues minus the number of declining issues every day, and we keep a cumulative total. So uh, typically, you would use the New York Stock Exchange, right? You think, well, I'll just, that's that's where you that's where you find breath, and we'll just use that. Unfortunately, especially in the wake of decimalization, which actually now took place about 16 years ago, um, the New York Stock Exchange uh, advanced decline ratio is not the best advanced decline ratio to be using because there's too many things on the New York Stock Exchange that are not stocks. There's a lot of interest rate related things like preferred stocks and um, you know, funds and bond funds and this and that to do with bonds. So uh, we, we have originally noticed this back here in like uh, where the number two is there. Back in April of one, I just happened to be watching TV and uh, at that time and, and someone said, well, the cumulative advanced decline uh, you know, line had reached a new all-time high, and I, I was a little bit shocked because I was saying, "Whoa, that, that doesn't seem right." So we started doing some research, and, and that was right. Actually, the uh, the advanced decline line, which is uh, the line, well, it's 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 uh, parallel here, but it's this line right here, and had made a new all-time high. And we, you know, I was saying, well, obviously it has to do with. Um, with uh, interest rate things doing well, and the reason those were doing well is because of decimalization. In the old days, a, a preferred stock, when the minimum tick was an eighth, preferred stock would be trading at 80. It would take a pretty big move in interest rates to make it go to 80 and an eighth. But if it only had to go to 80.01, that might happen in a smaller move in interest rates. And so these things began to be counted as, as advancing or another mark as declining issues, in this case advancing issues, because the Fed was lowering interest rates at the time. And the uh, advanced decline line was making new highs. But I said, well, we've got a very convenient other set of data to use as advanced declines, and that's all stocks and trade options. And that's a really broad-based set because we've got some NASDAQ stocks, we've got the big cap stocks, we've got mid cap, we've got everything. So I computed that advanced decline line, calling it the stocks only advanced decline line, and you can see that it was it was going down while the other one was going up, and this big divergence was taking place. And in fact, eventually the down was correct because we rolled over into a very nasty bear market uh, there in uh, 2002, <clears throat> 2001 and 2002 actually. So. Uh, we keep an oscillator. We actually keep both, one based on the New York Stock Exchange data and one based on the stocks only data. And our oscillator is this. Uh, we take wherever it begins, let's just call it M. So if you want the current value of M, just shoot me an email and I'll send it to you. So uh, tomorrow's uh, oscillator value is 90% of M plus 10% of today's advances minus declines. So it's a it's like a, you know, it's an oscillator, and uh, this is how it looks. This is the stocks only oscillator, so you can. Uh, this is calculated with option data, and this is the S&P 500 chart up here on top. Down at the bottom is the oscillator. When it's in this red area, it's overbought. Again, overbought doesn't mean sell. So we go into these overbought conditions that can last for quite a while. Like coming out of this, this is last January, February, coming out of that. Uh, market, we went into extreme overbought condition, in fact, the highest, most overbought we've ever had, but the market keeps going higher for a while. Eventually, when you come out of the overbought condition, that's your sell signal. Conversely, down here, you can, when it drops below minus 400, that's oversold, and you can see that we haven't had nearly as many oversold conditions, but we did certainly have one uh, last January or the previous August, and we had one here right at the time of the election. So right before the election, we had a, a bunch of days of negative breadth and forced the oscillator down into deeply negative levels. And then when we popped out after the election, right there, that was the buy signal. 
Uh, now we're back in an overbought state again, but of course, overbought doesn't mean sell. In fact, what we really like to see when we're making new all-time highs like we are right now, I want to see this indicator get overbought and stay quite overbought. That's an indication that the rally is broad. This particular, uh, particular rally is not as broad as some have been because there's a rotation going on out of, let's say, tech into you know, infrastructure, for example. That kind of thing is uh, a little more prevalent right now. So just simplistically, uh, the, both the breadth oscillators are currently on buy signals, and they're, they're staying there for now, so we're positive in terms of this indicator. I want to throw in just one other quick thing here. We got a buy signal last night at the close based on what I call the oscillator differential buy signal. So when the two oscillators get so far apart that the stocks only minus the New York Stock Exchange oscillator are more than 300, that means that you know the stocks only, people are really piling into the stocks only. Uh, that's an alert. And when it falls back below, when that difference falls back below 200, it's a buy signal. So uh, we did act on this this morning. You can feel free to or not. It's your choice. There have only been seven such signals since 1998. So does it happen too often? These are uh, after one day, after three days, after five days, 10, 20, 30, 60, 90 days. So if you look out 90 days, uh, you can see there were five winners, two losers. The average gain on SPX points was uh, almost 40 points. The most, the biggest gain was 103 points, and the worst loss was 30 points. So if you're playing this with options, you know, the plus 103 is certainly meaningful. The minus 29, you know, your options have limited risk. But notice the total dollars made after five days. These seven signals had six winners and one loser for a total of 87 points. You have to go all the way out to 30 days before the, the profits again get back to that level. So it's really very good in the first five trading days. Today's trading day number one. Obviously, uh, S&P is doing okay. It's up six. Not great, but it's up six. And so uh, that's, that's half the average gain uh, from the other seven signals. So just something to keep an eye on. Um, it's certainly a rare signal, anyways, regardless of how it turns out. So, uh, so, <clears throat> so our fourth in a area that we look at is uh, volatility, and our main thing that we look at in terms of volatility is, of course, the uh, VIX, the volatility index created by the CBOE, and VIX generally tends to trend opposite to the market. So, uh, like put call ratios do. So when the market is going up, VIX should be going down, or at least sideways. And when VIX is going up, the market should be going down. So uh, when the market goes down, and if it goes down fast enough, VIX shoots up fast enough, it creates a spike peak on its chart. Those are buy signals. And uh, conversely, when VIX is very low on its chart, you're not going to get a spike at the bottom of the chart on uh, VIX. It just doesn't really happen. It kind of tends to roll over or kind of muddle around for a while and then finally starts to make an uptrend. So when VIX is low and just muddling around, that's okay for stocks, they can continue to rise. When VIX finally starts to establish an uptrend, that's your sell signal. <clears throat> so let's look at this. Here's a chart of VIX, a recent chart, current chart. And you can see here there's several sp spike peaks that I've marked. Now again, using that same sort of nomenclature, a, a blue signal is uh, not good, loser, a red signal is good. So uh, in June at Brexit, right before we got to Brexit, we had a couple of spikes by VIX, but it kept going higher. Eventually, though, it gave this really nice spike there right at the day of Brexit and the big, huge rally that took place after that. The stock market pushed VIX all the way down here. And again, you can see now VIX is down here. The market can rally while that's happening, but then the market did sell off in early September. We had VIX shoot up to just above 20 and right back down again. That was a buy signal, and that one worked pretty well. Mid-October, we had the sort of same thing, but it was a little bit more lackluster. VIX came up and back down. That one didn't work, but now we had right before the election. Volatility started to pick up like crazy right before the election, and then as soon as the election happened, VIX immediately dropped, and that was another buy signal, which we're still on, frankly. Um, I have not exited the, the calls that we bought on that buy signal. Um, so 
the spike peak bisignals, we devised a system. I don't, I don't have time to explain it all here, but it expires after 22 trading days. So I'm, I'm back up a chart. So here you can see we got this um, in early November, and 22 trading days is about a month. So that signal is just about to expire in early December. So we're late this week. Uh, that signal will expire. We'll probably exit the calls that we bought based on that particular buy signal. Right now, VIX is trendless, so just pushing around down here, down 12, 13, 14, 13, you know, just hanging around down here, and so that's bullish for the market. So stocks can easily rally while VIX is trendless. I know on TV they're going to keep telling you, oh, VIX is so low, but VIX gets low and stays there for a long time. And you go back and look at some of the charts, you'll see that it went a lot lower than this for a lot longer than this. So just because we're below 14 or 13 doesn't mean anything. It just means that VIX is trendless and stocks can rise. Um, I'm just repeating myself there, VIX, VIX below 14, not a problem. So overall, the state of the VIX chart is bullish for stocks, not bullish for VIX, bullish for stocks. Now, there's another thing we look at, and it's called the construct of the futures on VIX. They're, they're very important to look at, too. The CBOE uh, website has the futures prices, and it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's I believe it's uh, futures.cboe. Dot com. But just just uh, Google CBRE futures, and it will come up, and you'll see that uh, that the futures prices are listed there in uh, delayed delayed time. So we look at how the the futures are trading at a premium to VIX, and we look at whether how the futures relate to each other. In general, it's very bullish when the futures are trading at a premium to VIX, and when the term structure slopes upwards. It's bearish when the opposite occurs, which doesn't occur too often, but when it does, you need to be paying close attention and getting out of stocks. But for right now, uh, this is just the other day. VIX was at 1286. Actually, this was not just the other day, but it was uh, similar. You can look at it right now. It's very similar. We have the various futures contracts. You see how each one is higher than the one, uh, higher price than the one before it. And so this is a very bullish construct. Uh, and VIX is the lowest of this group. The premium here, 97 cents, is this price, 13.83. That's the current price of VIX, 12.86 equals 0.97. And so you can see these futures uh, have big premiums on them. And again, that's bullish. Now, sometimes on TV you'll hear somebody say something stupid like this, like, oh, well, in January, the futures are trading at 19. So these futures traders think VIX is going to be 19 in January. And for the VIX to be 19 in January, the market's going to have to sell off. So they're bearish. That's complete garbage, completely wrong. It means nothing. The term structure will always slope upwards in a bull market. That's all you have to know. Uh, I, again, I can explain the whole thing. It'll just take a little while. but. By and large, this, not even by and large, but this is the truth, that when the futures term structure is sloping forward like that, uh, the, it means the market is, has a bullish outlook to it. And in fact, rather than, let's say, these like smart money you know, paying 19 for a, 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 a January future and trying to predict that the market's going to go down, in reality, smart money sells this future here, hoping that by January it's this price. So the, the big short, the, the real big short that really works is to sell those outward uh, futures contracts on VIX and cover them uh, when they become short-term contracts on VIX. Obviously, if the market explodes to the downside, VIX will go up, but most of the time that doesn't happen. Uh, here's the poor man's uh, construct as we look at the CBOE volatility indices. The CBOE publishes four indexes. The, there's a nine-day index, symbol is VXST. The 30-day index is a VIX that you're familiar with probably. The 93-day index, XVX, or VXV, sorry, and the 184-day one, uh, VIX midterm. Again, uh, here, these are current prices for this. And again, you can see they, they slope upwards. This one, each one is more expensive than the one before it. So this term structure is also sloping upwards, and that is also bullish for stocks. So all of these indicators in the construct here are bullish. 
Now, I want to talk about two other signals that we've gotten recently, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up here pretty soon. Um, normally, VIX is below VXV. I'm just going to back up a chart. So here's VIX and VXV. Normally, it looks like that. You know, VIX is lower price of the two. But occasionally, in a bearish market, VIX will rise above VXV. Now, you might say, oh, well, why don't we just go short when that happens? Well, I tested that, and it didn't test out that well because, especially in recent years, the, the sell signals have been very short-lived, and it just, it just didn't work that well. But it does indicate the market's oversold, so you get in that oversold state, you watch it, and then when VIX comes back below VXV, VXV then that's when you go long. So last time this happened was on November 8th. Uh, we bought the market. Then you get your best profits in the first five trading days. Uh, but we've written articles, you know, detailing this system in quite a bit of, uh, you know, minutia, and uh, it was quite successful, especially early on. But even after that, so uh, we bought calls on SPY based on this back on November 8th. There's another crossover system. Remember the the VX. Uh, the VXST is the nine-day volatility index. If it rises above all three of the other indices, in other words, above the 30-day, the 93-day, whatever it was, the 184-day, if the short-term one gets above all of those, then the market is extremely oversold. And as soon as it comes back below any one of them, that's a buy signal, and that last buy signal occurred on November 9th. Now, to be fair, we were getting so many buy signals on November 8th and November 9th that didn't actually take this signal in our newsletters or in my own account, but it still counts as a valid buy signal. So the conclusion of the VIX, the whole volatility area, is we're on the VIX spike peak buy signal, but only for a couple more days. The construct of the VIX futures is bullish. In other words, the futures are trading at a premium and the term structure slopes upwards. The CBOE indices term structure is also bullish, and VIX is trendless, which is also bullish. So that whole area is bullish. So let's sum it up, and then I'm going to show you one more system that we just got a signal from. So uh, the current status of broad market as of today is the S&P chart is bullish because we're at new all-time highs. The put call ratios were mixed because we had that sell signal from the standard ratio, which I, I believe is being you know, affected by these protection protection buyers, which are not true speculators, but uh, in any case, that's, that situation is mixed to positive. The breadth oscillators are on buy signals. VIX is bullish because it's at these low levels, and so that's bullish for stocks. The term structure is bullish, and so conclusion, bullish. <laughs> so we're staying long. Uh, probably hate use a stop below 2180 if it pulled back to there. But I don't really expect that to happen soon, or if it did, I was expect us to get some sell signals before that happened. So uh, one little last indicator here that's quite uh, useful, I call it the post-Thanksgiving seasonal. It really combines three different seasonal patterns at once. Uh, first of all, the, it's well documented that the market tends to rise between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And, and, a number of ways you can say this. You can say December is the best month of the year, blah blah blah. But you know, that's that's a given, or not a given, but you can back test it. The January effect, which is where small cap stocks tend to outperform big cap stocks, used to take place in January, but it works so well that uh, traders uh, trying to get a jump on things have pushed it back into December. So now, the, the time of the year when the small cap stocks outperform the big cap stocks is during December. And then finally, at the end of the year and into the beginning of the next year, is a period called the Santa Claus Rally. It encompasses the last five trading days of one year and the first two of the next. So if we put all these together, we got this. We're going to buy small caps. So uh, IWM is the Russell 2000 ETF. Buy calls on that. At the close of trading before Thanksgiving, to get that whole seasonal period, and, and we'll exit at the second trading day of the new year when the uh, Santa Claus rally ends. <clears throat> the uh, the results of this system going back to 1993 are uh, 19 wins and uh, five losses, and um, the last two years, unfortunately, were a loss. We we did not have a good December, especially last year. 
So that was two of the five losses. On, on average, uh, Russell makes 3.4% during this time period. Uh, on average, uh, that's the total of all trades. The average winning trade is plus 5%. The average of the five losing trades was minus 2.7%. So we, we bought IWM calls last Wednesday, the day uh, before Thanksgiving. I think there's still time to get in this trade if you want to. If you buy the, the seasonals and the system. Some people don't like seasonals, but you know it does work pretty well uh, most of the time. So uh, that concludes the seminar. Uh, again, if you wanted to um, take advantage of any of our discounts, and some of, them, some of them we have free trials to things, you can go to no, uh, optionstratus.com forward slash NovWeb and use that coupon code uh, NOVWeb. Uh, here's my email if you want to get the starting um, oscillator value am or have any other questions uh, just shoot me an email and uh, you know that that should work